as you might have picked up, God normally speaks to me through our life events. And we recently got to witness God joining our son, Brandon, in marriage to his lovely bride, Patricia. So this is what love looked like for us on that day. They asked us to say something on the wedding night, and we wanted to make sure we gave them advice that matters. As most parents can testify, it's not often that your adult children ask you for advice and are willing to listen. So we had to make it count. In preparation for our speech, God led me to look at what He intended love to look like, not just in marriage, but also in all of our other relationships. He made me dig deeper into why Jesus describes the church as His bride and what that looks like and means for us. So please join me as we unpack what love should look like. I'm going to share with you the key points of our advice to Brandon and Patricia and how that applies to all our relationships. So the first point, never stop dating. Make time for each other, especially in the busyness of our culture. Let's reflect on our own marriages. Are we still going on regular dates? If you are not married, it doesn't mean you are off the hook because Jesus calls us his bride. So, how regular are your dates with Jesus? Does he get that good morning Jesus and a smile? Do you ever invite him for a cuppa? I also like dancing and singing with Jesus in my lounge, but don't do it often enough. How about taking him to work or shopping or just walking or sitting on the beach with him? It's such a privilege to be able to have this intimate relationship with God, but do we value it and make time for Him? Then Jesus took me even further and asked, what does my love for the rest of the body look like? Do I make time for the members of Christ's body? Am I deeply devoted to the rest of the body? Let's look at Acts 2, 42 to 45. We read, every believer was faithfully devoted to following the teachings of the apostles. Their hearts were mutually linked to one another, sharing communion and coming together regularly for prayer. A deep sense of holy awe swept over everyone and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. Let's look at the definition of devoted. Extremely loving and loyal. This made me reflect on my relationships with the people in our church. Is my heart mutually linked to everyone? Do I extend the same grace to my church family that I would to my blood family? When someone receives an answer to prayer, am I truly rejoicing with them, even if it's the same thing I have been praying for and still haven't received? Why is it that sometimes we feel better about our situation when we realize we are, there's others that's worse off? Shouldn't our hearts go out to those that are finding themselves in a more difficult situation than us? Let's also look at how we extend grace. If someone in church fall into sin or does the wrong thing, how do we treat them? But what? If that someone was your brother or son or daughter or parent, would you not come alongside them and encourage them to clean up their mess? How do we behave in, uh, if church members hurts us or disappoint us? Do we just walk away? If we are as devoted to our church families as we are to our blood family, we won't walk away. We will stick by family, even when it hurts, or even if we are disappointed. I want us to have a good look at our own hearts. Are we faithfully devoted to the teachings of the Bible and, and the teachings in this church? Are our hearts mutually linked to one another? 
Do we have a deep sense of holy awe? If you want to see miraculous signs and wonders, those things should be in place. You can't treat your spouse casually, like only see him if there's nothing better on, or you need to prioritize your spouse and your marriage for it to be a good marriage with deep connection. And that's the same for your relationship with Christ and the body of Christ. We need to start prioritizing God and each other if we want to have deep connections. The second point, encourage one another. Look, I have this saying, if it's not encouraging and uplifting, don't say it at all. My kids said it will be engraved on my tombstone one day as I constantly say this to them. But it's so true. But you don't want my words for it. Let's look at what the Bible says about this. In Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, I'm reading from the uh, Passion Translation. Discover creative ways to encourage others and to motivate them towards acts of compassion, doing beautiful works as expressions of love. This is not the time to pull away and neglect meeting together, as some have formed the habit of doing. This tells us not to pull away from each other, but to encourage others. When we encourage each other and motivate one another to have compassion and doing good, it becomes what love should look like. See how important it is staying connected? When we are hurt and disappointed, we naturally want to protect ourselves. And a lot of the times it means our walls come up. Now these warmest walls are harmful to our connections. It makes us pull away instead of sticking out and working through the problem. When I look back at our relationships and where we chose connection and working through our problems, we normally come out the other side more deeply connected than before. Imagine what life can look like if we never run, but choose connection. But for that to happen, we need the next point. The next one is, be quick to forgive and apologize. No one is perfect. Only God can meet all our needs. Human beings will let you down and even hurt you. In those moments, be quick to forgive. The Bible is very clear about this topic. Let's look at Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Lay aside bitter words, temper tantrums, revenge, profanity and insults, but instead be kind and affectionate towards one another. Has God graciously forgiven you? then graciously forgive one another in the depths of Christ's love. I also want to look at Matthew 6, 14 and 15. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. So as you can see here, forgiveness is a choice. It's not a feeling. We never feel like forgiving when we are hurt, but we are told to choose forgiveness. None of us can afford not to forgive. We all fall short and need forgiveness. And if we don't forgive, then our Father in heaven can't forgive us. We cannot live in the covenant of grace, but keep others in the covenant of the law, where they have to pay for hurting you. Even if your pain is justified and you did nothing wrong. There will also be times when you hurt others. In those moments, be quick to apologize. Don't be stubborn. Be quick to forgive and apologize. Have you ever been on the side where you had to ask someone's forgiveness, but they refused to forgive you? It's torture. But all you can do is live in peace with everyone as far as it's up to you. You can't make them forgive you. But please, don't be that person who refuses to forgive, even if they never apologize or ask for, you for your forgiveness. Forgive them because Father God asks you to. Then number four, love each other the way Christ loves the church. Now let's look at Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, 
Love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. This is what love should look like, that you would give yourself up for the other person. Now, this is not just the husband's job. Let's look at Romans 12, 10. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. What would relationships and marriages look like if we honor the other person above ourselves? If, what if our focus is on meeting the other person's needs instead of having our needs met? That doesn't mean you have to go without your needs being met because you can get all your needs met with God. And then what people do is a bonus. What makes it possible to love like that? Giving to others from how God loves you. Let's look at how loved you are. Ephesians 3, 17 to 19 says, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Romans 5, 8 to 9 says, But Christ proved God's passionate love for us by dying in our place while we were still lost and ungodly. And there is still much more to say of this unfailing love for us, For through the blood of Jesus, we have heard the powerful declaration, you are now righteous in my sight. How beautiful is that? Then 1 John 3, 1. Look with wonder at the depth of the Father's marvelous love that he has lavished on us. He has called us and made us his very own beloved children. The reason the world doesn't recognize who we are is that they didn't recognize him. Here you can see that you are passionately loved by God without doing anything. Like I always say, there is nothing you can do that will make God love you more and nothing you can do that will make God love you less because he is love. He loves you 100% unconditionally. Now, because you received that love, you can also love like that. 1 John 4, 7 confirms this. Those who are loved by God, let His love continually pour from you to one another, because God is love. Everyone who loves is fathered by God and experiences an intimate knowledge of Him. Now, the fifth point is what God joined together, let no man separate. Matthew 19, 6 says, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. I sometimes get a bit nervous when I see how easily people separate what God has joined together. Now, I'm not trying to condemn anyone who is divorced, but I do want us to consider the weight of the commitment we make to each other in marriage. What if that is also true for the body of Christ? Jesus calls the church his bride. He says he will never leave us or forsake us. He is coming back for a spotless bride. He is working in all of us to accomplish that. But what if we are tearing the body apart? Christ speaks of the church as one. Listen to this prayer in John 17, 20 to 23. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Does the world see that unity in the body of Christ today? When I look at the New Testament, 
I see all the religions, and then there were those who believed and followed Jesus. Today, I see several subgroups instead of the one group who followed Jesus. We call them denominations. Now, I'm not against having different types of roles, different ways of worshiping. Jesus even refers to the church as the body of Christ, with many parts, each having a different role and gifting, but connected with Christ as the head and all the parts working together, every part is important. Let's reflect on how we connect to each other and how we are connected with other believers in our region and around the world. Do we encourage and uplift other churches and the members of this church? Or do we criticize or even disconnect when we are not happy with their behavior? Someone recently said to me that when a believer leaves the church, it feels to them like an amputation of a part. We are all uniquely different. That's how God intended it. But we are joined together by God in Christ. So let no man separate what God has joined together. Let's not mutilate the body of Christ. So just to recap, the first point, never stop dating. Make time for each other and God, especially in the busyness of our culture. Two, encourage one another. Three, be quick to forgive and apologize. Four, love each other the way Christ loved the church. And five, what God joined together, let no man separate. Now, if you are watching this with your home church group, please take the time to discuss and have conversations around the questions included in this video. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you loved us first. Thank you that we can now love like you. Lord, we repent for changing what love should look like and for loving in a way that's convenient to us instead of loving the way you modeled for us and what you enable us. So Lord, we surrender to you and we ask your help to help us love each other, love our spouses, love our children, and love our church family and the rest of the body of Christ the way you intended it so that the world will see and know that this is from you and that you exist. We love you, Lord, and we pray this all in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you.